Well, hello. Yes, I'm looking a little bit more formal today for another occasion, not for you, not for this. But uh, I wanted to go over this study that keeps being shared to me in relation to omega-3 supplementation and its potential heart disease effects. So there's this new study that uh, just came out maybe two, three days ago, something along those lines, and people have been sending it to me nonstop for me to diagnose, for me to analyze. So that's what we're going to do uh, in this video. I'm going to be going into a little bit more depth in on the, the main channel, but for the time being, let's go ahead and uh, get into this. So the study that everybody keeps referencing is this one. So regular use of fish oil, which obviously contains omega-3s, and the course of cardiovascular diseases, a prospective cohort study. So the reason why people have been uh, sending this to me is because the researchers end up uh, indicating that there is increased risk of atrial fibrillation. If you're not familiar with what that is, let me quick educate you real quick. So uh, when you're talking about heart rhythm, so how your heart functions, we've got, so these are uh, measurements from what's known as an EKG or an ECG. So uh, an EKG will essentially measure the electrical signal. I actually had to do several of these during my master's program. So we had to learn the heart intimately. So I'm going to be using a lot of that. Of course, I had to learn about it in my PhD as well. But uh, the general rhythm of your heart is that you have an electrical signal that starts out at this uh, section over here called the sinoatrial node that sends an electrical signal to the atrioventricular node and then that gets propagated that signal propagates down to the lower sections of your heart called called the ventricles now there's an additional signal signal that goes from the sa node the sinoatrial node all the way across to the other atrium over here by a a system called the Bachmann bundles. So this section here is called the Bachmann bundles. Anyway, there's more complexity to it, but that's how your normal sinus rhythm, so how your normal heart rhythm should work. And what happens with an atrial fibrillation is that for some reason, it can happen for any number of different reasons, the signal that sends this uh, electrical signal down from the atria, so from the top sections of the heart to the bottom sections of the heart, gets screwed up. So you can have multiple uh, contractions that occur within the atria, which then leads to blood pooling in that region, which can lead to clot formation, which can be extremely dangerous. So that's where the whole idea of this study being really scary, because again, as I mentioned, all the headlines are talking about how omega-3s are now implicated in disease, cardiovascular disease, and all that stuff. So let's go ahead and go through this. Again, I'm going to be going over this in far more detail with the uh, on the main channel, but for the time being, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's have a little bit of fun here. This is a baseline on how they went about doing the study, so I'm going to tell you about it real quick. So what they did is it is a prospective study, meaning that it's, it's an associative study, meaning that the researchers did uh, baseline questionnaires and baseline interviews on a whole host of different people. And then from there, and they did this over, I think, maybe five years, something like that. So a long time that they spent doing all these interviews and whatnot, and essentially collecting a ton of data on these people, this massive population of people that belong to this a database called the UK Biobank. Now that, now they had 400,000 people, over 400,000 people that were then able to be included in this study that we're going over. And then over the next 11 to 12 years, all the researchers did was just measure by hospitalization, as well as death certificates, and a bunch of other kind of official metrics, official measures, what happened to these people. So, and then they end up looking at a, a different uh, outcomes for cardiovascular disease. So we'll, we'll get into that. So it's a prospective study in that they do the interview, they do the baseline measurements, and then nothing else happens for the next 11, 12 years. They just end the study at 12 years. They collect the data at the 12 year mark. And another question that they ask is, do you take supplements? Do you take fish oil supplements and, or do you not take fish oil supplements? If they said yes, they, fall, they fell into one camp. If they said no, they fell into another camp. Okay, so that's essentially what this says. I'm not, I'm not gonna walk through it again. Then they were interested in not just looking at the effect that it had uh, 
that fish oil supplements uh, associated with baseline did it from baseline so from the beginning to the end of the 12 years was there more atrial fibrillation discovered by medical records for example the other thing that they wanted to look at was baseline to death did uh, more people die if they consumed omega-3 fats supplemented with omega-3 fats baseline to major adverse cardiovascular events so we're talking like stroke cardiovascular uh, other cardiovascular disease like myocardial infarction and i believe they maybe had one more heart failure was another one right here so it's uh, listed right here so myocardial infarction being a heart attack and then so that's three measurements atrial fibrillation death and uh, mace major uh, adverse cardiovascular events and then they did atrial fibrillation to mace so was there an increased risk once people already had atrial fibrillation did they then progress to have some sort of cardiac event or did they die so they're adding more complexity or doing more kind of these kind of these time-wise subgroup analyses so i'm not going to bog you down with too much more detail on that but i'm just saying that it's a little bit more complex than just looking at baseline versus 12 years later okay what happened Okay, so they did a bunch of other statistical measures. I'm going to go into that in the uh, main channel video on this. Okay, so here's the baseline data. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, for one, they didn't do any statistics on this, so this is all by eye. But even by eye, most of these are largely the same. So all participants, 415,000 individuals. They've got non-users, that's 285,000 individuals, and those that did end up using omega-3s. Again, that's only based on what they were consuming at the beginning of the study. So we don't actually know if six years in they decided to stop, like a few people started to stop. But that also doesn't really matter because it washes out considering the sheer number of participants. So you might have some people that were non-users 12 years ago and then six years in decide, oh, I'm going to start supplementing with omega-3s because this is not an intervention trial. So it's possible that these people suddenly fall into this category. But the researchers can't pick that up because they only do one measurement. They do the measurement at baseline, so that's 12 years ago. Okay, and then, you, of course, vice versa. You can have some people that were supplementing, let's say, for four years or two years or a month after they, they were interviewed, and then they stopped for the rest of their lives, or they stopped for three years and then continued again for another three years. The scenarios are endless. The point is that we don't know if they continuously took omega-3s. There's the assumption that they're continuously taking omega-3s. And the, the reason why that's not that huge a deal when you're looking at sample sizes of this size is because you have such a massive pool of people that even if, let's say, 10,000 people started supplementing in this group and 15,000 people started uh, or stopped supplementing in this group, would it really change the statistics that much? Probably not, because the vast majority of people are still supplementing or the vast majority are not supplementing. Okay, so they looked at a bunch of different metrics, again, all at baseline, and they were largely equal uh, across the board from physical activity, uh, alcohol consumption, smoking status, consumption of red meat, fruit, uh, body mass index, uh, ethnic group sex, like a bunch of different uh, factors that they looked at. But what we're interested in is this data right here. So I'm not going to bother you with transition pattern one and transition pattern two and all that. They're kind of fancy ways of saying like they looked at different metrics. Uh, we're not that interested in that. So what we are interested in, however, is this right here, which actually is true, is identical across transition pattern one, two, three, and four. That baseline, the beginning of the study to 12 years later, was there an increased risk of atrial fibrillation? And they show here the number of absolute events, 18,000 absolute events. But then what we're really interested in is the comparison against the non-supplementing group, right? We're not that, I mean, okay, 18,000, but like, does that mean that the non-supplementing group had zero? No, it doesn't. Uh, so we need to know the comparison of the supplemented group is the 18,000 like, outsized much higher than the non-supplementing group or is it much lower is the non-supplementing group maybe 22,000 people or or 50,000 people that have atrial fibrillation so this number doesn't actually tell us a whole lot it just tells us the number of events but 
it doesn't give us any context. However, when we look at the hazard ratio, well, the hazard ratio indicates the, the relationship between the two. So now if it's over one, the indication there is that if there's supplementation of omega-3s, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation from baseline to, eight, to 12 years later. So there's the association with development of atrial fibrillation. Now, of course, because there's also other aspects of statistics I won't get into, but called confidence intervals. We also have to look at the statistical value. So the p-value, if it's below 0 0.05, it's indicated as likely statistically significant. So we find that it is, which indicates that yes, indeed, omega-3 fatty acids are associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Now, another slightly scary uh, aspect is stroke risk. So there's also the same uh, effect was seen in stroke risk. However, the actual effect size is really, really tiny, or I should say the, the overall risk is really, really tiny. So this one probably is not as much of a concern and it is barely statistically significant with large, large comparisons over a long period of time. So is the stroke risk probably something that really matters? Not as much as the atrial fibrillation. However, the story doesn't actually end there. And that's where, that's where the, uh, the, the, the media landscape uh, really leads to an unfair criticism and view of what we're talking about here. The reason for that is if we return to this data here, is that if we focus in on, for example, atrial fibrillation, so these are people that have developed atrial fibrillation and they're on omega-3s, do they develop more stroke? Do they develop more, do they, do they die? It's not like they develop death, they're just dead. Uh, do they die? Uh, baseline to death, so you know, from that, that first starting point 12 years later, how many did more people die? Uh, did you have atrial fibrillation leading to more heart attacks, things like that. So actual like outcomes like, yes, atrial fibrillation is scary in its own right, but do you, you actually wanna know, is it leading to more death? Is it leading to more heart attacks? Is it leading to more heart failure and things of that nature? And the reality is that these are statistically significant, that, they, that atrial fibrillation, if you were taking omega-3s, actually led to a statistically significant effect but actually in the opposite direction, indicating that there's a benefit of omega-3 fatty acids. And the same thing with death. So it's, a, it's an interesting scenario. It's an interesting scenario in that you, it, there's an association with an increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation, but once you have it, you're still protected. The association is still, you're more protected from these actual really scary end outcomes compared to if you weren't supplementing with omega-3 fatty acids. So then the question is why, right? And the researchers point out uh, a few reasons as to why, so let me walk you through those as well. All right, so here we're looking at a cell membrane. Let me zoom in here, let's see if we can pull this up. Oh, okay, yes we can. Okay, yes we can. So here we've got a cell membrane and the way that your, your cardiac cells work, the cardiomyocytes work, or your cardiac cells in general, they have this gradient. So on the inside of the cell, so what we're doing is we're taking a cell and we're zooming into the cell membrane. Here's the cell membrane, which is made up of phospholipids. It's made up of largely fat molecules and cholesterol molecules. And on the outside of the cell, we have this, this gradient. So we have more positive ions, I'm not gonna go into ions and all that stuff. I'm gonna keep things pretty simple. You have more positive ions outside of the cell, outside of the cardiac cell, than you do inside the cardiac cell, which means that there's a, a gradient, meaning that there is more negativity in here than there is out here because there's that imbalance, which is separated by this cell membrane. Now, that cell membrane, as I mentioned, is made up of different fats. Now, when 
you have an electrical signal as we went over here, right? We went over SA node sends an electrical signal to the AV node, SA to the AV node, and then so on, bundle of his and Purkinje fibers and all that good stuff. I didn't go into all that detail, but the point is that you have this electrical signal. Well, that electrical signal occurs due to these this exchange of these ions. So then when the cell becomes becomes depolarized as in it becomes activated this electrical signal activates the cell and leads to the contraction of the cell leading to the contraction of these these lower parts of the 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 heart as well as the the higher parts of the health heart so the atria and the the ventricles that is facilitated by this exchange of these ions so the cell becomes active now the only way for the cell to become inactive again to return to its baseline state to then be activated again for the next beat for the next heartbeat is by by allowing the the positive ions that flew into that came into the cell that were allowed into the cell which then depolarized the cell to then be pumped back out of the cell and the way it's done is through these sodium potassium pumps so they'll take up uh, sodium and potassium and move them in the correct orientation that they need to be, which then reestablishes this negative equilibrium down here and this, this positive uh, ion gradient up here. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well, the reason why is because there have been studies, according to the researchers of this study that we've been, that we've been looking at here, where they mention that omega-3s, if they're overly consumed, an overabundant amount of omega-3s, have been shown to actually impede the activity of these pumps. And the reason for that is because they change the fluid dynamics of the membrane. The membrane itself gets, gets composed of too many omega-3s, which leads to changes in the dynamics of this pump. And therefore, you don't get this equilibrium. So you have certain cells that have too much omega-3s and you have a lot of heterogeneity, meaning that some cells have a lot of omega-3, some cells don't have much omega-3, which ultimately leads to the, the cell then not being able to function as in like being able to pump those ions back out. Now, additionally, you have some cells that can function normally because they, they're not inundated with too much omega-3, while other cells are inundated with too much omega-3, and that leads to this imbalance. So some cells are firing, some cells are not firing. You have this kind of a, a rigmarole that could lead to atrial fibrillation. Okay, so that's one thing. But that's actually only if omega-3 consumption is too high. If omega-3 concentrations are elevated but not too high, it actually does the opposite. That omega-3s being part of the cell membrane is a positive that actually improves the function of these pumps and therefore improves the function of these cells. So isn't that cool? So it's I'm not saying that this is a definitive proof that we have ab we know exactly what the cause is. And on top of that, I should add that the study that we just went over is associative. So we can't make any cause and, uh, cause and effect uh, relationships. But as I'll be talking about in the main channel video, there's actually more to this story that I haven't explained here. But I did want to give you a little bit of background on the study. Am I worried about this study? No, I'm not. Uh, is it possible that omega-3s lead to atrial fibrillation? Yes, it is possible. However, the overall net benefit of omega-3s is, in relation to other cardiovascular outcomes, is much higher than it is in terms of a risk towards atrial fibrillation. Hopefully that makes some sense. And that is not based on just this study, which I will be explaining in the main channel video. Anyway, hopefully this was informative. Hopefully it explains what the, the study is about. And just know that uh, from my perspective, I am not that worried about this study. And if you're wondering to yourself, well, what's too much omega-3s or too little omega-3s? Well, just tune into the main channel video. I'll be trying to give you a little bit of an answer on that because unfortunately this study did not offer any information on dosing that any of these participants uh, underwent for their omega-3 supplementation. Anyway, that's it. Till next time.